Praise God. Did you know that Isaiah 54 verse 17 says that no weapon that's formed against you shall prosper? Oh, isn't that a good promise from God? I love it. I love it. Let's ask the Father God for help right now. Father God, we thank you that in the name of Jesus, we have your spirit of wisdom here with us right now, helping us, leading us into the truth. And that's what we need. That's what we want. We receive your help for this series called Life in the Name of Jesus. Amen. Life part one. This is an essential series to your life. Look, what is life and what is it all about? Or who is it all about, right? Down through the ages, philosophers, scientists, and religious scholars have all tried to give humanity something for us to wrap our heads around to answer the difficult questions. Maybe it's just to give people direction and hope. For some, the motive is far less noble. They use the void to take advantage of people's fears, gain control of their thinking, to gain control of the masses, the population. Look, I'm going to say this a few times during this series called Life. If you don't ask the right questions, you never, ever get the right answers. Why is that? Because life doesn't tolerate a vacuum. In the absence of light, there is darkness. In the absence of truth, deception. God says it this way. He says, Hosea 4, 6, he said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. They die because of what they don't know. We have cute little sayings like, well, what you don't know won't hurt you. But the truth is, what you don't know could kill you. Ignorance is not bliss. It's dangerous. It's painful. It can be addictive and disastrous. Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist and orator, he once said this, knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Oh, I like that. We must ask the right questions. Some people are afraid of you asking those questions. They want control over your life and your freedoms. They use activism and media, government and education to remove deductive reasoning from the conversation all so they can push their new religion of subjective morality, so they can be the high priests, if you will, of an, an alternative life. Why does this matter to you and me? Well, think about this. The cookie doesn't decide what it's going to be. The baker decides what the cookie's going to be. The cookie may think, well, how arrogant of the baker to think that I can't evolve into whatever I want to be. What you and I know as we look from the outside in is the only option the cookie truly has is to either fulfill its destiny in being a cookie or fail to be a cookie. Now, this cookie may choose to think it's a steak, but at the end of life, when science does the autopsy, what do you think they're going to find? Yeah, that's right. At the core of the cookie, the cookie was always meant to be a cookie and only a cookie. Brad Pitt. Apparently, he said this in an interview. He said, I didn't understand this idea of God who says, you have to acknowledge me. You have to say that I'm the best, and then I'll give you eternal happiness. If, and if you won't, then you don't get it. Apparently, that's what Brad said in an interview. So for all the Brads out there, God promised the gift of eternal life to whosoever. You don't have to accept it. Like the ingredients of a cookie don't come from the cookie. Joy, peace, and happiness come from a source, the source. You don't have to receive it. Brad asks the right question. In Jordan Peterson's bestseller, 12 Rules for Life, his friend, Dr. Norman Doige, wrote this. Ideologies are substitutes for true knowledge. A simple-minded, I-know-it-all approach is no match for the complexity of existence, the complexity of life. These ideologies offer a brand of morality based on relativism. There is no real good. There's no true virtue. That's what relativism is. So what's left? It's a cult of tolerance. They call life, but it's a fraud. It's just a trap. It's like a child having a temper tantrum because he doesn't like the consequence of his disobedience. He stamps his feet and he yells, you're not my mom. So does that make him free? Inventing his own morality? Do you really believe that? If we stamp our feet long enough and say, there is no God, does that really liberate us to live this new thing called our best life? Listen to Psalm 14, verse 1. 
The empty-headed fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You see, that's what the fool says. God is the source of all life, and God doesn't allow evil, sin, or darkness because it's counter to life, your life. Labeling something evil is good doesn't make it so. A man-made law that legalizes sin doesn't make it moral. It only sabotages the life of its citizens and welcomes destruction, the opposite of life, which is the opposite of what God has planned for you. Albert Einstein once said this. He said, whoever is careless with the truth in small matters cannot be trusted with important matters. You see, that's secular culture. It's untrustworthy. They crucified Jesus 2,000 years ago, and they would be delighted to take another swipe at him. Power-hungry tyrants will never put up with a leader who gives true freedom to the same people that they want to control. That's why truth is rarely, if ever, confirmed by the majority. Truth is an enemy to the power-hungry. So this series, we're going to explore three elements that make up life. We can call them elements or virtues because they're fundamental to the basis of life. They're eternal, they're intelligent, and listen to this, all three of them come from outside of time and space, outside of creation. You will come to realize that these are three identities of life. They are truth, light, and love. So let's investigate them in that order for each of these series. I call them identities because as you'll see from God's word, they are first about who life is before they are about what life is. You see, God is truth, God is light, and God is love. Think about that. Life is birthed out of who, not what, identity and not purpose. When your pursuit of the big answers becomes centric to the who, then you'll find the pieces of the puzzle suddenly begin to fit. If you deny the great I am, you'll find yourself at the cruel mercies of chaos and relativism. Why is this so important to you and me? Look, until you know God, you'll never know your true self. The better you know God, the better you know your identity. Maybe you've been offended by watching people who profess to know God, but really don't. See, Jesus was offended with hypocrites. Did you know that? He found them intolerable. He was angry with them. But if you can't distinguish between a lie that offends you and the truth that saves you, your choices will keep you in the dark forever. You don't decide what you are. You discover who you are. The con job of our culture has seduced many to pursue refuge in deciding what they want to be instead of who they really are. That puts people on the road to disaster. Until you are certain of your design, you have no clue to your destiny. So you choose death when what you really wanted is life. So let's explore truth here in part one as a key element of life, truth. In answering the big question, what is life? Most understand that freedom is essential to life, but is that physical freedom, mental, spiritual, financial, intellectual? You know, there are people with extreme liberty, wealth, and freedom of expression and still live bound to the consequences of their choices, their frustration and bitterness, and they die hopeless. Is that freedom? Dying lost because you freely choose to be lost? To refuse the truth by substituting your own version of morality is a free act of choice. But truth is life, so how is that freedom? Freedom to be lost for eternity? God says in Deuteronomy 30 that he has given all of us, all of us the choice for life or death, blessing or cursing, but he says you have to choose. Even tyrants and dictators cannot censure your freedom to believe. Although they try, Jesus said this 2,000 years ago, and it's still as true as if it were just two seconds ago. John 8, verse 32. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, first of all, no one is born free, but all are called to be free. That's why we need Jesus 
The truth, the real truth, is an active force of life that has power to set you free. Freedom in tandem with the truth moves us forward into life. It's renewing. It's a renewing power and it actually grows. It has movement. You see, death has no movement. Life grows. It increases as it works with your faith. Galatians 5 verse 13 says this, it is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. Did you get that? Freedom can grow. Freedom can be destroyed by you. How? Using freedom to pursue the opposite of truth will bring you into bondage that atrophies the movement of life. You do the math. A tolerance for deception destroys freedom and welcomes death. Love, truth, and then freedom grows it grows with life. Romans 6 verses 15 to 16, and I want to read this to you out of the message version. Listen to this. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Here we go again. Offer yourselves to sin. For instance, it's your last free act, but offer yourself to the ways of God and the freedom never quits. All your lives you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God, you've started listening to a new master, one whose command sets you free to live openly in his freedom. Oh, I love that. Let me show you ideology versus truth. When a ruling class of people use a system of ideas to control others, it's simply an ideology. They use their theory of life to tell you how to live your life. And know this, ideology changes often and it's constantly deteriorating. Why? Basically, it's humanistic thinking void of absolutes, void of the rebar of life. They want freedom without truth. They want life without the standard of life. Ideologues want liberty of choice without the consequence of choice. A spiritual storm is here, separating lies from truth. It will bring a cleansing with a renewal. The late Dr. Miles Monroe once said this. He said, consequences are more important than decisions. You don't live with the decisions. You live with the consequence. Oh, that's good. These ideologues, they want to sow corn but reap carrots. Well, now, why should corn only come from corn seed, Theodore? Where's the equity in that? We should be able to evolve any crop from any seed, broccoli from corn, carrots from wheat, wealth from debt. That's only fair, right? That's foolishness. It's an offense to the truth. It's opposite to all that's life and goodness. You want more. You want the real thing. You want life, not some substitute or fraud or even worse. Have you ever had your foot or your arm fall asleep? The blood supply gets compromised and your foot falls asleep. That's at least what we call it, right? When you get the blood flowing again, you get the life flowing. You notice how it tingles. And at the very least, that's what it does is tingle. But sometimes it even hurts. Life flowing again where there's been no movement can be very uncomfortable. Spiritually, it's similar. And it can be the same in other cases. There once was a young woman who stumbled into a downtown mission. She was known in the area as a prostitute. She'd been terribly violated, hurt, abused all her life and lived an unspeakable reality. The preacher had just invited anyone who wanted to be free from addiction to come forward for prayer. And even though she was high at the moment, she wanted to be free. So she went forward. A few older women, they began to pray for her, asking God to set her free from the drug addiction. Suddenly, suddenly something happened on the inside of her and she was completely and instantly free from the addictions. She went from being completely stoned to fully sober. All of a sudden though, in her right mind, every memory, every memory she had run from came flooding back and she began to scream in horror. 
It was like a big screen she couldn't look away from. She saw all of the, the abuse, the shame of her lifestyle, the tragedies, the brutal loss of her innocence. The drugs had cut off enough consciousness to deceive her into thinking that she really wasn't hurting anymore and that her misery had somehow faded. The shock of her being sober made the reality of her pain terrifying. A precious older woman whispered, Dear, you need to let Jesus save you. He set you free from the drugs, but you need to let him save you from who you were and fill you with his love. The girl prayed. She invited Jesus to be the Lord, and suddenly life flooded into her heart. A beautiful smile lit up her face as the tears of joy rolled down. She was lost, but finally home in God's family. You see, true life starts today, and it renews you, doesn't replace you. It renews you for who you were always meant to be. That's real. That's the real power of life. If your version of life can't defeat death, it can't eliminate all of the, the destructive forces of addictions, then ask yourself, is that really life? Is this really life? Here's truth. God is life and wants a relationship with you. God's actually not religious. He's not remote. He's all about relationship. He is a giver and desires to place the essence of who he is in you. So what's that mean? Well, parents give their name to their kids, their identity, their values, their, their home training in the family business, right? Father God is truth. God is light and God is love. It's who he is. It's his family identity. So he puts his truth in you, his light in you. He puts his love in you. This is how we know we belong to Father God. The essence of true identity is reborn. It has to be reborn into us. Now, why did I just say reborn? Well, this is critical to the mystery of life because even though we're not born with it, we're destined for it. Yes, you're born for life, but you need an out from the curse of sin and death. We all do. Jesus said in John 3 that we're born of water. See, that's natural birth. But then we need to be born of the Spirit. That's the second birth. That's being born again. The second birth, which makes us free for life. True life equals restored design equals relationship with the designer. This is how he has relationship with you and me. Adam lost relationship with God when he exchanged God's truth for an enemy's lie. He traded the glory of God's light for the shame of being self-conscious. Today, they call that being woke. He let go of God's love for a sadistic dose of fear that began to show up quickly in his kids as hate and even murder. You remember Cain and Abel. Our secular ideology says remove the consequence of murder and people just won't murder. Look around you. It doesn't work. You must replace lies and hate with God's truth and love. That requires forgiveness and being born again. You must be born again to hold, to have life. Proverbs 4 verse 13 says, take firm hold of instruction. Do not let it go. Guard her for she is your life. People need instruction to drive a car, right? To play golf, to bake a cake. What makes you think that life, the most complicated coveted treasure in one million galaxies, doesn't need a driver's manual, some intelligent guidance for real? Most people can't even clearly define life for the simple reason that they usually try to answer what before who. Instructions, please. You've heard the philosophical question. What came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first, right? You can't answer from inside a closed system of what came first. The real question is who? Who started it all? Who made everything that exists? Who is the author and intelligent designer releasing all of that energy source and design for what we call the Big Bang Theory? 
It's not a theory. Look, it's about the who, not about what, but who. You see, now that opens up the system for a plan, a design, blueprints with preparation, and not just some random release of energy that evolves into a blue planet with a chicken. <laughs> Look even closer at this thing, this identity of life called truth. Remember, life is truth, and truth is life. The who determines what, otherwise what you are doesn't even matter. Look at society, even your gender has lost significance. Why? Because we've lost our bearing on who, which comes from the truth. God doesn't just tell the truth, he is the truth. What does not decide who? Who you are decides what you are. John 14 verse six, Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except by and through me. You see, Jesus answers a direct question about his identity saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then he intentionally pushes into the relationship factor we talked about. He said the point of truth, the way of life, is to have relationship with the Father God through him. Knowing who gives us truth for all the questions about what or how. Origin is essential. Let's read John 1 verses 1 through 4. In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God Himself. He was present originally with God. All things were made and came into existence through Him, and without Him was not even one thing made that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. You see, Jesus is the truth, and here we see the truth is God's Word. Yes, God's identity as the Word is the truth. That's Jesus. The truth is the word and the word is the truth. In this maiden voyage of life, part one, we are focusing our attention to see that all things, all things were made and came into existence through the word, which is truth. The chicken or the egg? The answer is yes. God's unseen truth created all life that is seen. Jesus, the Word, or as we've learned in Life Part 1, the truth has come to free us from the law of sin and death, the law of rust and decay, the law of entropy. Instead of devolving into chaos and dysphoria, we get to transform, not evolve, but transform into a new creature in Christ Jesus, which is a being of life, a child of God born again of the spirit of truth. So let's remind ourselves, we need to ask the right questions to get the right answers. How do we respond to truth? The desire is to live life, and not just live life sort of haphazardly, but to live it strong, intentionally. I wanna do something different, and instead of just tell you, I wanna show you. I'll tease to part two by saying this. I've got these four action items on how to respond to truth that I know are gonna really, really help you, are gonna bless your life. But right now, I've got some amazing people who are gonna show you how to do this. First of all, let's take care of this part of it. We've learned freedom is essential to life. We need to be free from to be free for. Jesus makes us free from the curse our sins, and sets us up to be free for the blessing, which is real life. Just like that precious young woman coming off the street wanting freedom. What does the application of truth look like right here, right now for you? Where does life truly start? First, we all need to get saved. Receive Jesus, the free gift of God's grace. Pray this simple prayer along with me. Dear Lord Jesus, Please come into my heart. I believe you are the only begotten Son of God. I know you died on a cross for my sins. Forgive me of all my trespasses. I want to live for you. Help me to know the truth. Put your word in my heart. Fill me with your spirit. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's word 
is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.